Hello and welcome everyone to a brand new episode of What We Know. My name is Jake and while I don't have Sam DeLev with me this week, I did bring on a couple of people that know significantly more about our topic today, which is Eric Campbell. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, uh, asking our guests... Uh, which uh, Jim, the project manager of the brand new uh, Klingon Wars book, and uh, Al, uh, who is the lead writer. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, let's first of all, let's like I know I have a list of questions, um, and we've we've kind of discussed them. But can you just give me whoever wants to take this just a brief overview of what this new book is? Mm -hmm. um, Al, why don't you go ahead and jump uh, jump right on in there? <laughs> so the Federation Klingon War Tactical Campaign uh, is a is a book that is set in Discovery era where players get to tell a uh, a parallel story to that which occurs in Discovery season one, and they have the option of adding an additional tactical uh, strategic overlay on top of that, where they actually take on the role of admirals who are assigning assets to different hot points around the galaxy. That's very cool. That's very cool. Okay. So with this, um, let's get to know both of you. So if, uh, if, if the person watching this has never seen or heard of either of you, uh, let's start with you, Jim. Um, you are the project manager of this. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, sure. So the, as the project manager for Star Trek Adventures, basically I'm responsible for the line in terms of creating products from conception to print product in hand, basically, uh, just guiding that entire long process. Uh, Al will be happy to remind us that uh, this book was two and a half years in development. So, you know, two and a half years ago, the leadership at Modiphius and myself, we got our heads together and said, okay, we're working on Star Trek Adventures. What products do we want to develop? Uh, we go through, a, 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 you know, not to sound boringly corporate, but we have an agile methodology that we go through and we figure out, okay, here's, Those were here's, words. The, here's, the, uh, here's what we want this product to do. Right here's here's this concept we have for this product. Go see if it's feasible, and then I'll reach out to the different uh, you know stakeholders and say you know, hey, I want to do this thing. How much is it going to cost? Do we have the resources available to make it? Do we have the budget? So on and so forth. Blah blah blah. I uh, run a budget line to find out if it's even feasible to do. Right, given like the components that we want in it, or the page count, or the word count, or whatever. Like, what does the totality of the end result look like from a from a business perspective? Um, and then I, uh, you know, we go through the meetings and we get it greenlit, or hopefully we get it greenlit. And then once it's greenlit, I'm off to uh, the races in terms of development. I'm reaching out to writers who are going to write the thing. Uh, I'm working with my art director, and, and my art director then goes to find artists to make the artwork, right? So myself and my art, uh, art director, we uh, write all the art briefs. So all the great art that you see in the book uh, that has to come be conceptualized, right? Like, oh, we want, you know, let's do a picture of three characters sunning themselves in the lounge uh, during a supernova. That'd be kind of cool. And then, you know, he goes, finds an artist to do that. Uh, with the Lower Decks book, uh, we were able to use screenshots uh, from the show, of course, but for uh, the uh, Klingon War book, we had to use a lot of original art because uh, uh, there's just only so much original art out there, either in the Paramount archive or otherwise. Um, but then, uh, you know, just continuing on from there. So uh, it's, it's uh, hurting a lot of cats and tribbles, and it's keeping things moving on schedule and on budget. And uh, because I'm also the line editor for Star Trek Adventures, um, I get to get my hands dirty with all the with all the editing and developmental editing and moving pieces around. Uh, once it goes, in, especially once it goes into layout, I think uh, we get our graphic designers involved, and they take you know the manuscript and the art and all the components, and they turn it into the beautiful books that end up coming out the other end, right? With the layout and the design and all that stuff. And uh, I won't bore you with just how much work that goes into <laughs> turning a Word document into a book because it, it gets it can get super fiddly, especially when you're like, you know, you lay out a page and your page is two lines over, right? And, or it'll bump down to the bottom of the page and you got, okay, what do I have to cut? What do I, what strategic cuts do I have to make in this one column of text in order to make everything fit and look pretty? Uh, so it's a, it's a lot of meticulous detail and, and hard work, but, uh, you know, once it gets done and it's out there, then, uh, you know, fans get it and enjoy it. So that's broadly what a project manager does is kind of like herd the cats from be the beginning of a project to the very end of the project so that once it's finally in hand, it's done. Finally, finally done, complete, over, and, uh, you know, then we're off and running. 
that's that's uh sounds like a way more work than i ever care to do <laughs> uh, <laughs> um so okay so clearly this is not your first book that you've worked on can you talk a little bit about uh your past and like what you have done to get yourself to working on this book in in the first place yeah sure so i i think um I mean, I've always been a writer, right, for, for as long as I can remember. And um, I, you know, back in the late '90s, I was doing the whole writer thing, where I was writing novel um, pitches or short stories and sending them out to markets because that, that's what you did at the time, and because you know, uh, electronic publishing wasn't quite what it is now. Um, and then in the early 2000s, I was a freelance writer and a, a playtest coordinator on Decipher's Lord of the Rings RPG. No kidding. And so I got, I got really got, kind of got my um, hmm. start in the RPG industry doing that. And at the time, uh, Decipher also had the license to do Star Trek mm -hmm. um, RPGs. And so I was just starting to get into getting my hands into starting to think about working on the Star Trek RPG as well. Uh, but then the company folded. And, uh, and then nobody picked up the Star Trek license for another 14 years. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, I kept writing, I kept editing, I kept proofreading, you know, just finding gigs where I could, uh, working in, in the industry and outside the industry. Uh, when the Kindle came out in 2007 or something, uh, electronic publishing just blew up, like independent publishing just blew up. Um, I wrote um, seven books, self-published them, uh, in addition to doing, you know, other, other um, stories that were being pu published in other... Um, uh, anthologies and whatnot um but just like doing that for long enough i was developing a skill set that was going to be useful i didn't know it at the time of course uh, but then also in my day job because of course no almost nobody in the rpg industry works solely in the rpg industry you've got to have a day job to supplement it which is a unfortunate reality but uh, i was a project manager in my day job and so all that like the agile methodology the waterfalls all, all the practical uh, professional skills that you develop in a job setting with like, you know, how do you communicate with people up and down the up and down the chain? How do you effectively communicate with a VP versus a, um, um, you know, somebody that you're mentoring, right? There's a different, there's ways of doing that or, or if you're doing it laterally too. Uh, and then, you know, working with uh, vendors and subcontractors and external vendors. I mean, all that stuff, right? It, it's all yeah. business oh, stuff yeah. that just flowed into uh, my skill set. And then finally, I got this opportunity to work with Medifius and uh, they made me the project. You know, I said, well, you know, if you really want the details, I started just as a writer on the first core book when it came out in 2017. And um, I mean, Modifius was really super lean back in 2016, 2017, right? And they needed help on everything, right? And I was like, well, I'm a writer, I'm a proofreader, I'm an editor. Do you have anything I can help with editing wise? And so I did my little assignment for the core rule book. And then uh, Sam at the time, Sam was the project manager. Uh, among many other hats that she wore and um and she was like well why don't you edit the first adventure anthology because that that was another project because we wanted to get that adventure book out about the same time as the core book uh, so i rapidly got involved in editing and part of that is working with writers and um you know assembling the book basically right so that was really kind of my first opportunity to start pulling a book together um and then just continue on from there in 2019 uh, Sam was ready to move on to uh, bigger and different roles at Modifius, and that left a, a vacancy as the project manager for Star Trek. And, uh, you know, I made my case saying, well, you know, I've kind of been doing this work for four years now. It makes sense to just yeah. slot me in, right? You've, you've prepared me for this, so give it, you know, let's see what happens. And uh, they did that, and I've been doing it ever since. And, uh, you know, that's why I've had the, the great opportunity to bring in uh, new writers uh, like uh, Al and Michael and uh, so many other folks. It, it's always a joy to be a... Uh, I didn't appreciate this as a writer, but now that I'm an editor, I appreciate it differently. Where if you get to say as an editor, oh, I helped give that person their start in the industry, or, or I gave that person their first opportunity, and now look at where they're going with it. That's that's such a humbling, joyful experience to know that a lot of people got their start, not just in the industry, but just writing in general, because they were given an opportunity and then they, they did great with it. So I, I get a lot of joy out of that. But I guess broadly, that's that's where I've been. That's where I am. And uh, for now, where I'm going is continuing to work on Star Trek Adventures. And, uh, you know, I've I've uh, I've missed working on my own fiction. So I'm trying to get back <laughs> into that a little bit as well and just trying to find what's the happy balance between the two, you know? Sure. No, no, that makes sense. Um, now, uh, I'm I'm going to go uh, and we're going to talk to you Al, a little bit um, mm -hmm. as as 
as one man uh, who loves wonderful patterns on their shirts to another, uh, I, I love your shirt. Uh, that is that is that is a great shirt. Is is a wonder. I wanted to start off by saying that. Uh, butter you up. Now, I I don't think we need to explain to people what a writer does. I feel like they understand that writers write, and the lead writer leads all of the other writers. So uh, we're gonna skip that question. We're gonna go straight into uh, you know. What has led you to to being here? Like, how, like what? Le clearly, you are a fan of Star Trek, you know. Um, so yeah. So, I originally started writing RPG stuff back when Fifth Edition dropped. They started some community content programs, and I was able to write some adventures that were premiering at conventions around the country. And I think I probably have like you know half dozen dozen of them up on Drive Through RPG. And then once the pandemic hit, uh, all my players wanted to keep in touch, you know, digitally and wanted to try something new. And so we started playing Star Trek Adventures. Well, I was going through and playing Star Trek Adventures and using Tabletop Simulator, where mm -hmm. we would all get in and look at the Tabletop Simulator Star Trek Adventures support and play there. And I was posting images of what that looked like online uh, among all the various Star Trek groups. And... I got invited to a panel with Michael Dismuke and Jim Johnson happened to be on it. I had, you know, we, Jim and I kind of hit it off right away. We had a lot of the same ideas bubbling in our heads. And then uh, we did a uh, community like campaign that was written by a bunch of Star Trek fans. And that got posted up on Michael Dismuke's continuing mission site. And uh, Jim saw my stuff and asked me if I wanted to help out. And I got my stuff in on time. I guess it was pretty decent because then he asked me to be lead writer on uh, this tactical campaign. Nice. Uh, that, that I mean, that's kind of like, I, I don't want to say rags or riches. That's not the correct thing. But that's kind of like, you know, going from like just, you know, a player to, you know, one of the larger properties and being involved with it and being um, uh, um, just from playing it and enjoying it. Like that's that's a lot of people's dream. That's really cool. Yeah, and Eric can probably speak to the fact that now that he put something in his mouth that he's eating. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things you want to do when you're a writer is to just keep writing, right? Keep getting your stuff out there, and eventually somebody is going to see it, and somebody's going to appreciate it, and you'll get an opportunity. So if you get that opportunity, you obviously have to execute on it, which I, I suppose I did pretty well because this is my sixth or seventh book for the line. Hmm. But um, yeah, Eric, like when you started writing like just talk about that as soon as you uh get a chance to uh yeah you know, play um, snack. <laughs> uh for me uh I, I started my my writing goes back to writing quote unquote fan fiction for my own D, &D characters back when i was 14 and um i was a kid that you know growing up with adhd it was the 80s and 90s and not a lot of people had as much information about it back then so i was in special education i was being observed by teachers and stuff like that um i got slapped with all these labels of having learning disabilities and one of the things that they discovered was is that i was hyper focusing on things that interested me and ignoring everything else and one of the things that interested me was writing these fantasy character stories that i was creating so that's how it started for me and the ball just kept rolling and uh I, you know, I, I I went to school for science and stuff like that, and, and I was trying to learn all of that, and it ended up becoming writing more than anything. I discovered that the, the, the example that I love to give is that I discovered I wasn't Jacques Cousteau, I was Jack London. I wanted to write about nature and communicate about uh, the world and uh, not, not necessarily take classes in chemistry because um, I wasn't very good at it. So yeah that's how it all kind of got the ball rolling and then flash forward to today it's funny because um all of my writing kind of segued into screenwriting and that has found a place in storytelling and running games which i've been doing since i was 14 so um that's how that kind of happened and and you're right though it the the if you if you keep if you stick with a thing and take bold action with it serendipity just kind of finds you um i got my job at geek and sundry because i was serving coffee and I struck up a conversation with a woman named Kim Evey, who at the time was the head of a production company called Nice of Good. And they were doing a show called The Guild and looking for writers because they had just gotten a ton of YouTube money to go start a channel called Geek and Sundry. And Felicia was completely overwhelmed and was looking for writers. So 
she was like, uh, why don't you submit your writing piece to me? And I was like, sure, yeah. After we struck up a conversation, after I served her some coffee, I, and I hated the job I was at. It was just the worst job. And I was like, what do I have to lose? Um, so I, yeah, I submitted writing, didn't hear anything for six months. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I've shot my shot and went back to doing my little writing projects. And then out of the blue, I got the call and I thought it would be an interview call, but it was like, no, no, we just want you to start writing for Felicia. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then that, that segued into eventually uh, the, 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 just being there and showing up. Um, I, I leapt uh, that I turned into the social media manager and then I got offered the job as creative director and, uh, and then I was running games on Geek and Sundry's channel. And here I am. Like it, it all came from writing. It all just came from like, because writing for me was acting on paper. And that's why I moved to LA was for, for acting. So I just, yeah, that's how it just kind of snowballed. But you, it's kind of very similar where you just kind of found your way into doing it. And bam. I think that Jim did give me two little mini interviews in mm -hmm. that he sent me uh, the Shackleton Expanse book before it released. And he said, hey, as an outsider who's new to the game, what do you think about this book? You know, is there anything mm -hmm. that like we're missing, anything that we're, we need to tweak? And I, I was honest with him. I sent him back a couple, like everything that I loved, a couple of things. I was like, I don't understand this and I don't understand this. And then within a week or two after I sent those to him, he's like, hey, we're doing these things called mission briefs. You want to write a few? And it all spiraled from there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, th th this is all great stuff. I think the bottom line that I'm hearing, and, it, and I totally agree with you, is uh, keep writing and keep getting your stuff out there mm -hmm. and be willing. I mean, you got to be willing to share. Like if you're a writer and you're submitting stuff to short story anthologies or to markets or you're just trying to get it out there, you, you got to get over that stage fright. Right. And, and like mm -hmm. uh, Eric, you talked about um, screenplays and uh, and, I, and I come from a theater background. Right. And, uh, you know, if you want to be in a play, you have to audition. You have to put yourself out there. You got to do it. And so if you're a writer, like everything you write is an audition and you may not realize it. You may not be intentionally doing it. In fact, you should just be doing it for the love first. Show your love in your work and then post it somewhere where you can find it. I mean, that's how I got started with Decipher hmm. is I loved I loved their game. And I love the property. So I was writing up like characters and adventures and just, you know, posting. There was a couple of fan sites that were going on at the time. They weren't quite as well developed as Continuing Mission is, but they were good. I mean, for early 2000s websites, right? I mean, it was a whole different world. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, the, the line manager of the game, uh, Jeff Tidball, he noticed it. And then I reached out to him and said, well, hey, you know, do you have any opportunities? And that, you know, it, it led from there. But if I hadn't just loved the game and started submitting that stuff and just, you know, giving it to other people to enjoy it, it, it would have never happened. So you just got to do it. One of my favorite aspects about doing what Jake and I do is mm -hmm. that I am starting to meet people and get to know people and become friends with people like yourselves. But you in particular, who worked on Decipher, it just blows my mind because I'm meeting so many people who created the work that I was playing. And mm. and and it's, it's so interesting. And I, I thought I would be a little starstruck, but what it is is it's just incredibly exciting to meet uh, the the other creatives to find out how their process happened and how they they ended up falling into it because quick quick story when we were when I pitched Shield of Tomorrow over Geek and Sundry and they decided to go with it we didn't know Star Trek Adventures existed we didn't know because you guys were still in Alpha so we didn't know y'all were in the play Modifius was in the play testing and we had no idea um, but GNS was becoming hot shit at the time because uh, everyone had started hearing about the show Critical Role and people were starting to realize that there was a way to demo their games online in a constant manner. There'd be a lot of fun and easy to like demo the product. So anyway, I dropped my entire uh, tax return check <laughs> on going onto eBay and finding every Decipher Star Trek book that I didn't have, which turns out, the collection was quite small because, as you said, the company folded pretty early um, into that run of Star Trek. So, uh, but I already had all the Lord of the Rings books. So, um, I, it, as soon as I blew that check on getting those Decipher books, uh, that's when we got told that there's a company out there that's got the license to do a new Star Trek Adventures game, and it might be coming out soon. And that set the whole thing in motion. But um, I still have that full collection. I have the entire collection, physical copies, <laughs> and they're just like these little. Like they were worth a lot of money, but then you guys started printing Star Trek adventures and now people are really interested. But yeah. So well, uh let's let's actually get into the book and talk a little bit about what a lot of people are going to be seeing and what they're going to be uh um playing. Okay, so 
the first thing I immediately uh, saw when I was going through the book was, um, of course, the species, the cool, the cool choices in which players get to do because at heart, you know, we all want to uh, make a bunch of cool different creatures and things. Out of the plethora of species in Star Trek, what made you guys choose these to add into the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, um, I, I want Al's perspective on this as well, of course. But, uh, you know, after seven years of working on the game, we've got what we must have close to 90 playable character species like with, with full statistics and, and talents and stuff. Uh, Cause there's so many species in Star Trek that we could pull in, right? And we've got up to about 90. And then we were looking at this book and we're like, okay, what can we drop in here? And I think my only like requirement such as it was, was like, I wanted to see some deep cuts. I wanted to, I wanted us to go into the weeds of like Star Trek three, Star Trek four, the background scenes of the Federation council meetings where you see all these really cool prosthetics and makeup. And like the, I'm sure the the crew was like, Oh, they're never going to be close up on camera. They're going to be just background noise. Right. But like, I know that the FASA game and then the, the last unicorns and decipher, like the other RPG game lines, they pulled some of those species out and said, mm -hmm. Oh, well, we're going to give them a name and we're going to give them a little bit of a background and some history. So you're like, Oh, okay. Uh, so I think when we were putting the outline together, uh, Al, we must have had like 10 to 12 species candidates that we were like, oh, these would all be really cool to include in the game. Because what we were thinking, we knew this was going to be a Discovery Era book primarily. So we knew that we were, you know, 30 to 50 years before the movies, but we were within that original series, you know, time zone, right? So we were like, okay, so everything from like the original series out to all the movies are all fair game for us to pull content in. So let's see what what, we, what we've got. And um, uh, we also knew we wanted the Anar because, of course, um, uh, Hemmer was on Strange New Worlds. Right. And we, and we wanted to give some, and there's also a character in um, uh, Enterprise, right? That was an Anar. So we wanted, we definitely wanted the Anar. But the other five were like, oh, we could go, we could get crazy with these. Like, let's let's have some fun. Um, Al, what am I missing? I think that, that was the highlights. But uh, I, I what, think yeah, whatever. definitely that we were trying to create a united um, 20, uh, 23rd century, right? And mm -hmm. uh, we. For sure, we're looking at different body types, different yeah. facial structures, different things like that, just to provide. It's not just a Romulan with pointy ears, right? This is something that if they are on a ship, you might need to make special arrangements for mm -hmm. because of their body size, because of what they breathe, things like that. I think that we did a really nice job of representing all of those body types with the art. In, in this bit and i think i can't wait to see what players do with some of these characters because you definitely need to have specialized ships or at least mm -hmm. specialized sections of ships for these characters to work in yeah especially like the areolo you mm -hmm. know you, i mean basically you got a centaur mm -hmm. type of character now on the that you can have on your ship and that's just that's just cool and different right and i think um if you look at what we did with the the species the original species in the shackleton book um and then lower decks and the uh, the animated series uh, PDF that we did last year, like those that we, we were really trying to be intentional about bringing in very non humanoid species into the mix because it's Star Trek. You could yeah. and, and not only is it Star Trek, but it's an RPG. You don't have to worry about a budget. You don't have CGI. You have to pay for. You don't have prosthetics. You have to pay for anything you can imagine. You can literally do it. So if you want to play a you know a a, a Starfleet character who's a you know, a, a sentient praying mantis. Sure, sure. Why not? You know, I, I know like some of the novels, the uh, the Titan series of novels has a chief medical officer who's basically a velociraptor, right? <laughs> why not? Sure. Anything. Can, you can do anything, right? And we, we were just trying to scratch the surface of that. So I think, you know, just over the last, I don't know, four products, five products, we've added so many different species that we just wanted to continue that with this book and, and bring some different stuff in. So I, I think, uh, and then we had, I think, I think John uh, Kennedy was the one who primarily did most of the heavy lifting on the background and the, and the talents, right, Al? Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. and one of the happy accidents that occurred here with the six that we narrowed it down to, which there was a lot of conversation going back and forth about mm -hmm. that, was that two of these six species in this book are pacifists. Yeah. Pacifist cultures in a wartime setting. The stories just with that. Mm -hmm. are far like far reaching so we were pretty mm -hmm. excited when we saw uh that written in by uh, by john mm. yeah um on the note of like species i just gotta say like it, it was perfect because obviously you were pulling from the show but that you guys added exocomp 
as a playable species in the lower <laughs> decks just cracked me. I was laughing so hard at just the species options in that. But yes, I totally recognized the Arcadian right off the bat. I was like, that's the creature from Star Trek Four in the audience in the, in the in like the court scene. So mm -hmm. it was really awesome to see that. Um, that's one of the things I will say about New Trek is that it really is bringing in all these fantastic new alien designs because obviously they're not as restricted as they were back in the late 60s, early 70s when they were doing the TOS. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, it, it's one thing that, I think one of the things about what you guys are doing, which is really exciting with a lot of the playable species, is that um, one of the great strengths of Star Wars is that incredible diversity of alien species that are just kind of thrown together in that galaxy. And to be bringing that in to Star Trek in a much more expansive way that you guys are doing by adding these new playable species, I think is fantastic. And it immediately enriches the entire galaxy of it. So mm -hmm. I just love that there's so many more, so many more options. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of options, uh, you have uh, added optional uh, tactical rules for uh, the game. Can you talk a little bit about what those are and uh, what was the drive behind adding them into the game? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Al. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, 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 I mean, I, I like mechanics, but I, I'm always I'm always going to lean into the narrative before I sure, go into mechanics. Sure. But, I, but but fortunately, and this is why this is part of the reason I brought him on as lead writer. Al Al loves developing mechanics and 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 creating things. So uh, please, please uh, uh, elucidate. <laughs> so we were very deliberate about calling this a tactical campaign as opposed to a campaign guide because this is unlike the Shackleton Expanse, which is just, uh, which is a bunch of really cool stories with a bunch of, you know, supporting mission briefs that you can tell almost in any order. This is more designed to tell a parallel story to what's going on in, in Discovery. The tactical overlay is a system that was designed by uh, Ivan Sorensen of uh, Five Parsecs from Home and Five Leagues from the Borderlands fame. And he put together this idea of a procedurally generated war game that players could take part in and generate assets to go deal with different uh, situations around the galaxy. And so what we did, once he sent that to us, we went through and we play tested it and we kind of Star trek eyesed it a little bit, added a, a, a little bit more in uh, so it felt a, a bit more like Trek. But using this system you can play as admirals in any war not just the klingon war it's like a tool that you can drop down on top of any setting the only big difference is you have random tables where you generate assets and the assets in this book are specifically focused towards the federation klingon war that we saw in discovery season one if you wanted to tweak those assets to be a more modern take and do the Dominion War, you can absolutely just use this system to do that as well. Now, I, I know this isn't involving this book specifically, but you were talking about charts and and and, and like gra and stuff like that. I will say my my favorite chart that I have used multiple times uh, playing this game is the Techno Babble chart from the original book where when i because i was playing an engineer in my game where i'm like i gotta say some stuff and that i have no idea what it means <laughs> I, i'll always love referring back to that one <laughs> mm. um i got a question for you and this is the big question that i've wanted to ask the moment i found because i didn't know this book was even happening until you were like by the way we have a new book coming out and i saw that and was just like because i I've, I've still been really excited by the idea of exploring themes within Star Trek Adventures that are not just captain and crew. And when you guys put out the players and GM's guide, it was really exciting to see the dive into playing an admiralty campaign. What's a non-federation campaign look like? Like really diving into the entire Star Trek universe experience. Um, but what gripped me about this one is it's war in Star Trek. Now, that's a theme, obviously, that traditionally gets ducked a lot. There's a lot of people that say during the Roddenberry era, that's something that Gene didn't want in Star Trek. And there's that 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 <laughs> infamous story that's not 100% accurate about the blindfolded statue of Gene Roddenberry when they were doing DS9 because of the Dominion War. Uh, so, uh, quick backstory on that. 
uh, for anybody who may not know this, um, there was a bust of Gene Roddenberry at Paramount, or no, it was on, I think it was on Rick Berman's desk, and they were, come. The, the story goes is they were coming up with the Dominion War and uh, for DS9, and they ended up, um, they ended up basically blindfolding the statue because they were afraid that Gene, uh, they didn't want Gene to hear it wherever he was. They didn't want him to see what they were doing to Star Trek. That's actually not the full story. Rick Berman's clarified that it was just a joke because of what they were doing, but it just kind of stuck. So, um, but it, it it's fascinating to me that putting out an entire war campaign book in Star Trek, there's got to be a real that's that had to have been a real balancing act for you guys, right? Because obviously you want to keep it Star Trek, but you're delving into a subject matter that classic Trek steered away from. I find compelling because DS9, of course, raised the great questions of how do you have a utopian society when not everyone lives in utopia kind of philosophy. So uh, I'd like to just hear real quick, like what that was like putting the book together and, and what your thoughts were on creating an entire war campaign. Um, let me just add an addendum here. I have had a lot of discussions about this book with my good friend Thomas Maroney over it from Star Trek Online because uh, he and I are huge master and commander style like lovers of naval combat. So we love Star Trek, but secretly in our little space hearts of like wa watching tall ships blast the hell out of each other. Par part of us were just like, oh, this, this is kind of cool. I know, I know, I know, but this is kind of cool. So, uh, yeah, I would just love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I I don't know that I fully appreciated that about you, Eric. Like I, I knew Thomas for sure, mm -hmm. but uh, like having grown up reading Patrick O'Brien and Alexander Kent right. and uh, yes, Forrester, um, and and watching as many you know Royal Navy era kind of movies, mm -hmm. like I'm I'm all over it. Like Master and Commander, absolutely my jam. Uh, so uh, I'm right there with you for for just appreciating that aspect of it, and uh, even to the extent that uh, I, I'd love to find ways to fold more of that into Star Trek in general, not just Star Trek Adventures, but just just some of the philosophical pieces of the militaristic side of things. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm quite into Starfleet as a military as Thomas is. <laughs> um, like, like I try to lean a little more toward canon, but uh, that, you know, Itic is Itic is mm -hmm. Itic, so you know, more variety the better. Um, but so like this book was in, we started developing this book two and a half years ago, even before Strange New Worlds came out, mm. if you can, if you can believe that timeline. Um, and so like the characters of, of uh, Chapel and uh, Mbenga hadn't even crossed our, you know, bandwidth, right? To even imagine what it was going to be like. What we knew though at the time was that we saw the war in Discovery Season 1. And we knew about the the Dominion War and how those wars had impacts on people, and you know, totally makes sense, right? Uh, war and conflict is a, you know, I hate to say it, but it's true, it is a foundational human thing that has been explored in Star Trek, will continue to be explored in Star Trek, and it's something that we just didn't really touch on that much in the game because it just, you know, I mean, partly because of the production schedule, there was only so much room for stuff in our books. And war was generally de-emphasized in the franchise anyway, right? Even though we did have the Dominion War and we had the first war in the franchise. But mm -hmm. um, it felt like, you know, even two and a half years ago, it felt like the line wanted to grow and expand and, and bring in more, I don't want to say more mature topics, but just like be willing to face certain things head on and say, okay, you want to run a war campaign? Here's some tools that can help facilitate that. And I think that was one of the design philosophies that we baked into it from the beginning is like, okay, war has an impact on people. Even people who aren't in the war are impacted by the war. You're, 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 you're facing trauma, you're facing PTSD, you're facing all kinds of stuff. Mm. We see it all the time with veterans coming back from the wars in the Middle East or wherever they're fighting. Like they have real, a lot of them have real hard challenges reintegrating into, into you know, normal society because of the experiences they've had. It'll change you, right? No matter what, what you're doing. And it's like, how do we you know, handle that respectfully, but then also how do we bring that into the game so that you can inform your character? Okay, you know, your character just played through the Dominion War. How is that, how are they going to be coming out of it and going back to an explore, exploration primary focus, right? Or if for the, you know, dis, for Disco, right, your character joins Starfleet to do science and to explore and to study the mycelial network or whatever. And then overnight, they're now thrust into a galactic confrontation that they probably weren't necessarily trained for right they weren't this wasn't their focus right um so we wanted to really bring a lot of that in and i think um al and uh, michael duxbury especially michael duxbury wrote the whole section on uh on trauma and uh um uh, I, al i want you to pick this up but uh, I, I did want to say um 
in a weird way, I'm really proud that this book is the first book that we published that has a content warning at the very beginning of it saying, this book is going to cover some heavy stuff. Mm. If you are not prepared for that, then just, you know, go into it eyes wide open that we're going to be talking about some, you know, pretty significant stuff. Um, I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, yeah. And additionally, uh, in addition to that, there's also a safety checklist in the back yeah. uh, that says what, what stuff are your players comfortable with seeing during a wartime campaign? Right. But make no mistake, like, when we were designing this, we wanted it to be character focused. We put tools in here to show how your characters change during wartime and how war can have an impact on them. We talk about delivering different uh, like things that happen during the war via your family members saw a part of it or your friends were a part of this starbase raid, you know, things like that just to make it real. In fact, we even have a thing, a crew casualty report in there where you talk about if you lost crew members when your ship had a breach. And it's not just a, 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 a blank face that flew out into space. You actually have to name that character. You have to create a backstory for that character mm. when you are recognizing them after the battles are done. So we really wanted to focus on characters during wartime. Additionally, I saw this as an opportunity to present some more tactically focused options for people that like to do the pew pew stuff uh, people that might be coming in from other games that focus a lot more on combat now you have options that you can use while you're doing combat secretly i was hoping that this would really appeal to starfleet battles and even mm. the old fasa simulator mm -hmm. uh, players and it sounds like there are a lot of them that have been checking this out which is pretty cool. Their first time ever looking at Star Trek Adventures because now they have some some options in here that bring back the old ideas that they were familiar with 30, 40 years ago. Hmm. That's awesome. Really cool. Okay. Now, um, when you guys were working on this and you had decided, yes, you went and moved for it, it was greenlit. Um how many nights did you all sit down and watch the Discovery seasons? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, gosh, I mean, I, I, I watch, I mean, I've always got Star Trek on so, uh, some of some format, right? Uh, and it's not just because it's research, but it's because I just, I, I love the franchise, right? And I've gotten to the point now where um, I've got my preferences, certainly for series that I, I hold near and dear, but I appreciate everything Star Trek. And uh, I've, I've gotten to the point now where, and, and this is a personal fault probably, where like when someone says, you know, you know, I'm a big Star Trek fan, but I hate Discovery or I hate Lower Decks or whatever. I, like I have a cognitive dissonance because it's like, it's all Star Trek. How can you, <laughs> how can you hate? And plus, you know, plus, you know, with, with Idic, right? How, how is hate in your vocabulary as a Star Trek fan, right? I mean, that's <laughs> you know, like it's not anybody else, but like, how do you hate something? Like you, you don't like it, sure. Maybe it's not to your taste. But to say you hate it, that's a pretty big word, right? And uh, and then I, what I really want to do is I want to start drilling into it and say, okay, you say you hate Discovery. What specifically about Discovery do you hate? Is it the characters? Is it the actors? Is it the writing? Is it the, like, what is it? Is it just a gut feeling that you hate it? I mean, I, I don't know. I could go on about that. But uh, um, so I've been, you know, I watch Star Trek all the time. But for this book, I, I always try when we're leading, heading into development on a book, I try to refresh my memory on the either the episodes or the series that are most relevant to that book uh, for this one though it was pretty easy it was watching season one again um umpteen dozens of time I, I mean i've probably watched discovery the first two seasons of discovery at least oh gosh i don't know probably 10 times straight through but i cherry pick episodes too because you know of course you know when you, when you have a tv series a season that's 14 15 episodes long you know i, I don't want to say any of them are filler but some of them are less important to the meta story than others. And it's relatively safe to skip them. Once, you, once you've seen them a couple of times, you're like, okay, I appreciate the acting. I appreciate the writing. I appreciate the craft that went into making that episode. But it's safe to skip if I'm looking for the broader scope of the story. So like the, the, the season opener, the season finales, I've watched those probably you know, 25, 30 times individually. Um, season two, I love season two. Um, particularly with the, uh, you know, uh, Pike Spock and, uh, and Una in there. And I thought the season two was just so crisp, but like that's relevant to this, of course, but, uh, watched it a lot. Um, Al, how much uh, prep did you do for, uh, for the book? 
so this yeah specifically looking for we like to put quotes at the start of each one of our chapters yeah. so looking for specific quotes that embrace the feel of war we wanted so we have six missions that are full missions that are in the book that happen over the course of the war so we were trying to find specific events uh that were happening over the course of the war and some most of the events that you play through in this book are are almost throwaway lines of dialogue yeah. that people are mentioning oh and this happened right mm -hmm. so now you get to tell the story of that by playing through the tactical campaign so uh, we were definitely, I was definitely watching episodes to try to, oh, they mentioned this, this incident at Corvin too. They mentioned like, you know, or a couple of times, a couple of them we get to see a few scenes of as like Discovery jumps in and then jumps out. So when we said, and one of the things that was awesome about this particular wartime is that Discovery is gone for half of it, right? They're over in the mirror universe. So this allows us to encourage the characters to tell their own heroic story here while discovery mm -hmm. is gone right so that's when i say that we're telling a parallel story to what discovery experienced during the war that's exactly what's happening like every now and then it bobs and weaves and maybe connects back up with the discovery story using scripted scripted events but you don't see the uss discovery really in these missions at all it's its own thing and you are doing you are doing your own hero ship things which was uh, a really cool part of this story mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's one of the powers of the of the flexibility of the campaign that we wrote into it is that um because the discovery and her crew are not a focal point of any of it other than the scripted events if you were to take those those handful of scripted events that we put in there and rewrite them for the Dominion War or the Romulan War or any other war out there, you could very easily take all the adventures and the mission briefs that are in the book and reskin them to anything else that you want to. It, it, like the stories, I think, would still pretty much work if you take them out of the Discovery era, you know, that, that early, um, that, that mid 23rd century and put them somewhere else, uh, just because it's, it's just so flexible. And I mean, we try to do that for all of our products is to say, you know, here's an adventure. It was initially written for, you know, TNG era, but make this tweak and this tweak, and then you can put it into Enterprise Era or you know wherever else you want. So I think there's a lot of flexibility built into it. Um, Al, you did bring up a great point that I, I wanted to just highlight for those who like to hear a little bit about the sausage making, but the uh, the research process. One of the reasons that I enjoy rewatching the episode so much is because um, in Star Trek Adventures, a character's values are are oftentimes bits of dialogue pulled right out of the right out of the show because the character when they're, or person when they're talking they will tell you what they believe or what they think or what they think is important to them and that in this game translates exactly to a value right so if someone says you know i'm starfleet to the core blah 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 it might be a throwaway line in the moment of the episode but you pull that out and it's like okay that is a core value of theirs that is important to them that is something that as a game master i can challenge at some point and say okay you know you're now you've now discovered that Starfleet is doing something kind of heinous on this uh, planet. Like, are you still Starfleet to the core, or has that been colored a mm -hmm. little bit? Um, but then, so so it, the you know picking watching an episode and picking out dialogue is a great thing to do. But also uh, because we do put those chapter quotes, uh, the the pull quotes at the beginning of each chapter, that's a great opportunity to find quotes that are thematically linked to the to, to the subject matter of the chapter. And I just I mean that's one of my favorite things to do right near the end of. Uh, developing a book is to is to scrub those um those quotes just to make sure i've got the right quote for each chapter uh that's one of the one of the fun things i get to do as the project manager is that uh, i'm usually the last set of eyes on the on the book before it goes to print and it's like oh i can i can make one little tweak here and uh, <laughs> my, my partner laughs at me because like we'll, we'll watch star trek I, i've turned her into, into a star trek fan and uh, and we'll be watching a new episode or we'll be watching a rerun and i'll pause it like i'll pause it and, and pull out my neo and jot down what quote i just heard or i'll go back and put turn on the subtitles just to make sure i've got it right and she's like what are you doing it's like oh I, i'm doing research that's a great quote and i don't want to lose it so i want to make sure i've got it recorded somewhere so that in some future book um down the road that i may not even imagine yet i've got this long list of quotes available and ready to go um, you know, I've got, I've got, I use a uh, Scrivener to, to take a lot of note taking and to compile all my notes. And I've got a Scrivener file that is just full of quotes from different characters and different shows that I, that I can tap into and say, Oh, yep. I need that. I need that. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I can go, uh, go run with it. 
So you actually mentioned something uh, where you're talking about other books and, and pulling from them. Mm -hmm. What would you say that you have uh, learned or improved from previous books that you've kind of brought into this book? I'll, I'll start on this, but Al, I want your perspective because I think um, working with Al, especially um, because he uh, he he's really familiar with the RPG industry in terms of like what products are out there and what game lines are out there uh, to a degree that I'm not because honestly, I have lived in such a Star Trek Adventures bubble for the last eight years now. Like that has been my entire gaming life for the most part. And like, I know there's other games out there and I, I play Pendragon and I play Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. But like, if you told me like, what's Pathfinder up to or what's Starfinder up to or what, what the, what's this other game line? I'm like, I, I've heard of it only because I'm in the industry, but like, I don't know. Uh, so um, what, I, what, what Al reminded me, and he does a great job of this and I'm grateful for it, is that uh, he reminds me and then also the business side of things reminds me is that the products ideally need to appeal to both players and to game masters right mm -hmm. you can't in this in this economy in this day and age it's not enough to do a book that's solely aimed at the game master or solely aimed at the player because you need sales from both right and i hate to say that it's you know uh, it's about the money at the end of the day but ultimately we're still in a capitalistic society we need to sell books in order to make more books and uh, yeah, they yeah, need yeah. to be profitable enough to make more, right? So uh, Al does a great job of reminding me, okay, what's in this book for the players? What's in this book for the Game Master? How do we balance the content so that players are happy with the stuff that they're getting? And the Game Masters are happy with the stuff that they're getting. I think, you know, if I had to look back at the Shackleton book, um, that was, you know, 316 pages of amazingly awesome stuff. But I would say probably 85% of it was aimed squarely at the Game Master because it's a, it's a full-blown campaign. It's 40-odd mission briefs. It's tons of content and lore about that setting that a player is like, okay, well, I'm playing Star Trek. Put me wherever you want to put me. You know, it doesn't matter what sector I'm in or whatever. We had some new character species options and we had a couple other bits and pieces. But for the most part, that book is aimed solely at the Game Master and just anecdotally <laughs> i know that there are way more players of this game than there are game masters right it's always i mean and, and this is probably true for any game except maybe dungeons and dragons and pathfinder it's super hard to find people willing to run a game right but it's super easy to find people to play it and uh, and that's a challenge because we want to try to appeal all of our products to both to both categories and it's, a, it's just a tricky balancing act um al uh, what, what what can you add to this yeah, I think that we learned, we followed a strict pattern with how our books are laid out, right? We almost always start with a history of the Federation or a history of this time and whatnot. We made a very distinct decision to start with your character options right up front. The first thing that you see are these crazy, strange, new uh, species that you can be. And then we do the talents and all that stuff. So the first, what, 45 pages of the book are all character options stuff and we kind of we did it early because if the gm's running the campaign we don't want the players to accidentally flip through that stuff so we did that we did add uh, again we said the safety checklist uh and the content warning those i think are best practices now uh, but this is our first time we got a chance to get it into a star trek book i think that you know we we started to use some more of the flow charts, like what we saw in Captain's Log. Not nearly as many as I would like, uh, but we did start to throw a few in here to try to help with the rules for the tactical overlay. So uh, those things are all, I think, where we would like to see the line start going eventually, is make the game more accessible to everyone, and some not just the people that can read five paragraphs in a row. Some people need to see it. So I think that we're moving in that direction. And we got a little bit of that in here as well. I love that. As somebody who is neurodivergent and has trouble digesting rules, but this is what I do, I cannot tell you how grateful I am to see that kind of information dissemination in a book. It's just really nice to see that. It makes it much easier to run and, and, and promote the game. So also, quick question for you. Can I take this book? and take the Klingon core book and run my Galron versus Duras civil war scenario 
in TNG. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah, that, uh, that when I first saw this and I saw that it introduced this new tactical option, I was like, there are so many, there are so many things that that happen in the span of weeks and weeks and weeks and like TNG and stuff like that that gets kind of a throwaway, as you said. Can you play out that story? Because that was the first thing that came to my mind. I was like, oh my god, you can play the Galron Duras Civil War in TNG. That'd be amazing. So, so yeah. the, the way that this is structured is the it, the the campaign overlay has stages. And each stage has turns. We have early war, mid war, and late war of the Klingon uh, Federation war mm -hmm. that happens around the Discovery era. Each stage has three turns in this particular setting, but you can adapt that to anything. Like mm -hmm. if it's a longer war, you can add more stages. Like we were talking last night about if we wanted to do the Dominion War, you would almost want like a pre war part where all of the subtle stuff is happening ahead of time. And then if you have shorter sections of the war between like uh, scripted events, you could do like a two turn stage instead of a three or a five turn stage instead of a three. So there's a lot of flexibility there. If you were going to do this civil war, the one thing that you would need to change or two things you would need to change is there is a character asset table that right now is specifically focused on Discovery Era and a ship asset table that is specifically focused on the Discovery Era. You will need, so, and th both those tables have 20, you know, characters or ships on them. So you would just have to come up with thematic, you know, characters or ships that would suit the time for the Civil War. And I think you could easily take that overlay and place it there. Yeah, in fact, that would be super cool, Eric. Uh, to, to just thinking about the Klingon <clears throat> Civil War, we were talking about that last night. We were like, well, you know, right now it's Federation focused, but there's nothing stopping you from taking those two D twenty tables and like making it all Klingon. Here's here's twenty yeah. Klingon NPCs. <clears throat> here's twenty Klingon ships, um, and then and then you're running it purely from the Klingon perspective, or, right. or change it to you know some some Klingon, some Romulan, right? Of course, because the Duras was uh, was in league with the Romulan, so maybe you've got some Romulan shenanigans going on mm -hmm. in there. Uh, along with it um uh you know if you wanted to set this I, I, I had this weird bug in my head to set it um on the cardassian border and have the badlands be a piece of it so it's like the whole cardassian border wars that they had with the federation in the 2340s or something mm -hmm. so you've got cardassian assets and cardassian characters that you can pull from ds9 right the, what, what were these characters up to in their earlier career like what was gull Vec doing during the cardassian border wars what was Who the knows? city in order up here? to yeah 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 so um i think just just once i realized in totality what exactly you know once i once i fully wrapped my head around the tactical campaign and now i know it took me a little while to fully grok what you were creating mm -hmm. i was like oh shoot you can you change these two tables you can do literally anything uh, in fact, we were riffing last night on, uh, you know, the, in the 27th century, there's supposed to be this big temporal war, right? You could take that temporal war, add as many phases to it as you want, add, add as many assets to it as you want, and you can have a, a temporal war that spans from Enterprise all the way out to the 32nd century, and you could bring in literally any character that you've seen on Star Trek, any That's ship that you've seen idea. on Star Trek, yeah. and just go and go absolutely bonkers with it. Um, and, and Eric, this just ties into what we were talking about at the top of the show where we were saying, or, you know, I was just throwing out the idea that, you know, if you wanted to do, a, a like a senior staff campaign mm -hmm. and then do an occasional lower decks camp, you know, uh, uh, storyline along with it, captains, yeah. now you can, now you can go a level up and do, you know, if you, if your, you know, story leads you to the point where you're involved in a war or something, or even like a border skirmish, use this tactical campaign as a, as the next level up, mm -hmm. do a session or two of that where your players are are playing through some of these events as admirals or something. Yeah. Um, see where this, where see, see where things get positioned and then see how your, how the results of your tactical campaign inform the next episode that you run from mm -hmm. a, you know, an RPG perspective. I mean, there's just so many ways to play with it. That's now. really cool. Yeah. yeah. And I'd we haven't even talked about captain's log. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So. Uh, well, I do I, want to jump in. Uh, can yeah. I jump in and just yeah, say, yeah, yeah. there are a couple of things that I want to hit on before we yeah. wrap things up. I'm sure that we're moving in that direction, but a couple of cool variant rules that exist that people have been really enjoying uh, that we've been hearing on social media. There's um, there are rules in there. If you want to do a large scale ship combat where players no longer control their characters on the bridge, but each player takes control of a different ship within the fleet battle. So there's rules on how to do that. 
Uh, there's rules on how to do initiative with starships, with small, smaller ships activating first. And really? Activating last. Initiative in Star Trek Adventures? What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, there's a rule variant. Oh, how to make swarms of ships. Like if you want to use enemies that use sw the swarming technique of many, many small ships, there's rules in there to do that. Hmm. My favorite one is the power distribution system because power has always kind of been this abstract thing that most people kind of ignore when they're playing the game. But if you're an engineer and you're looking for something to do during Starship Combat, now there's a way that you can assign power to each of your systems. And whenever that system assists you making a roll, you take a power away from it. And then you can shift power from system to system and things like that. So there's lots of little cool bits like that that are variant rules that you can add to your game as you feel comfortable. Okay, I have a question that you probably can't answer, but this has led me to want to ask, are we getting a sneak peek right now at these optional rules that some of the things are going to be showing up in second edition? Well, when I was when we were working on this book, we didn't know that second edition was coming. Right. So it was years ago, <laughs> right. Unfortunately. Uh, I think that Jim knew that this would be kind of like the swan song of first edition. Mm -hmm. But we didn't until my bit was pretty much done with the book. I didn't really know that second edition was coming. So, right. um, so unfortunately, I wish I could make that transition a little bit better, but I, I know that, the, <laughs> yeah, like, like the, the tactical overlay be, and, you know, just like captain's log is almost its own game. The tactical overlay is almost its own game as well. Mm -hmm. So that should be pretty pure moving forward. But um, yeah, uh, as far as can everything else appear in second edition, I can't really speak to that because I was designing, um without knowing that that was coming. <laughs> right. I, I do want to say one thing real quick about, because you touched on something of, about ship's power. I just had this conversation with my players last night and the day before, because we are currently in development for Clear Skies Campaign 3. And um, we, we've been having a lot of character discussions and whatnot. A large part of it has been, okay, well, the first game we ever ran was the Sally Ride. I created that ship and gave it to the players like Starfleet was assigning them this ship because they had never, uh, that was a development process where I learned the Star Trek Adventures rules and then I had to introduce everybody to it because it wasn't even printed yet. Now, Clear Skies is a little different because I worked with Thomas Maronian coming up with ideas and then I went to the crew and said, what kind of ship do you guys want to run? We're going to build this the way Star Trek Adventures traditionally builds a ship. They built the Ross. I took that to Thomas Maroney and Thomas Maroney built, built the Ross. And we go from there. This time around, I told everybody, I was like, hey, so one of my personal regrets as a GM was in both Shield of Tomorrow and Clear Skies. I am not a big fan of how little I engaged with the ship rules. Like I want, I really want you really lose something if the ship is not a character in the group with the rest of the characters and to give everybody an opportunity we, we got a little bit more into it in clear skies but in this upcoming campaign i told everybody i just i was like i want you all to know y'all are going to need to track power for everything you do when you use the transporters raise shields and jump to warp it's all going to become a vital part of everything you do because i realized you get so much more engagement from your players when that ship is something they have to take care of, it's what's going to bring them home. If you treat her like a lady, she'll always bring you home. And uh, the idea is, is that that incorporates a, a vital aspect of Star Trek Adventures into um, into the campaign, into the into the feel of the game. And the reason why I was bringing up Second Edition is because that optional mechanic that you introduced i'm like oh man it's such an interesting idea the idea of resource management not just adding subtracting power which is easy enough but to like shift around where power is going can really make playing an engineer exciting and that's like a really cool idea of distributing it to your fleets is a really cool idea and like giving them power and whatnot i don't know i just thought that was really cool yeah so regardless of what shows up in second edition we do know that the the second edition is going to be compatible with first edition mm -hmm. so i don't think these 20 books on my shelf are going to go anywhere right 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 that's um, the big question i've been so, getting <laughs> you know so so even if it's you know even if it is there or isn't there you could use the first edition rules no matter like no matter what right mm -hmm. so like that that's what's cool about it cool like, I, I'm, I'm 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 excited with this option right on well Thank you so much, Al, and thank you so much, Jim, for coming on and talking yeah. to us. 
Um, if you would like a copy of Star Trek Adventures Federation Klingon War Tactical Campaign, um, you can get your book on Modifius's website where you can buy uh, hardback uh, or digital copies. Um, so head over and, and pick the book up. Uh, until then, um, have a wonderful night and uh, live long and prosper, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having us on the show. Thanks really appreciate it. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Be well. If you enjoyed today's episode, give us a like and subscribe and tell us your favorite track in the comments below. You can also catch us on twitch.tv slash althaven underscore, where we stream RPG content, including the occasional Star Trek adventure. You can also join the conversation on our Althaven Discord. And if you want to support us, you can do so on coffee.com slash Althaven. So go, trek the stars, and until next time, keep it weird, internet. <laughs>